I've been lucky enough to work in a variety of different places, universities, the health service, in the UK, in the developing world, in war zones. And the one thing that's always struck me is how learning, how education changes people's lives. The profiles that you're about to see show how Kingston University does that for people. It changes lives, it develops people, it gives them opportunities that they might never have had before. You'll meet some interesting people who've done some fantastic things that we can be really proud of. Our new strategy is designed to make sure that Kingston stays as a university that does that, but does it even better, that we continue to be a place where people can come to, to gain the skills, to gain the confidence, to make the friends, that means that they change their lives and continue to change the lives of those about them. I work as a freelance illustrator. I enjoy having a dig um, politically. I work for The Independent, The Spectator, The Guardian, The Observer, The Times. I work three days a week at the university and the, the, the other seven at uh, home at my studio. Teaching is great and it's great foil to my practice as an illustrator. Um, I think I'd go spare if I was in my studio alone all the time. So here's Boris and he was such a pleasure to draw because he's such a vile character. Um, and you know, that, that's where I'm at my happiest. I think all my colleagues do this sort of delicate balance between their own practice as artists and designers and themselves as teachers. And that's a really important balance because it means that we have currency as teachers. It's sort of contrary to my political view, but that's I think the really, students really, good. really want to know what we're doing as professionals within the industry. They hear us talking about um, the students' ideas all the time, but they want to see what we're doing. They're also interested in some of the nitty gritty about how I'm published, how I sell myself as, uh, as a designer illustrator. And there is the finished thing, we flipped it um, and that was just the, the next day. And here's a whole sequence of spectator covers. Kingston's got a really famous art and design school. Um, it's thought of as really one of the better ones. <laughs> Within it, there are some subjects that, that stand out, and illustration and animation is one of those. I have really smart, interesting students, um, and they keep me young. But I'm sure there's a way that we can do that. The, the, the group that I was talking to were all illustration students, and they are very, very ambitious. They know that that is what they want to do in life, and that's what they've always wanted to do, actually. It's kind of just like a little background, like kind of trying to give them a bit of personality. Like he's a bit of a geezer, mm -hmm. but his dad's like this like wheeler dealer kind of man. Students were set uh, a brief to create stories that had the potential to be published. They had to really think about uh, the markets they were aiming at. And they'll show us sketchbooks, notepads, brim full of usually some great ideas, and, and we'll help them sift through those and we will submit those to publishers. And we've had lots of success with doing that in the past. We to just get the flow right and the feeling right and be careful of the too comedic. Let's get some real good reference. Last year we were working with Salman Rushdie. I initiated a collaboration with his publisher and the students started to work with animations and with illustrations on his new children's book. It was great, it really focused their learning and they got a foot in the door. Now that is fantastic for their portfolio and it will make the difference in them getting work in the future. The BA Honours Illustration and Animators all get it up an opportunity to do life classes um, at Kingston um, and it really really can make the difference with their creative work. As before you use the music, think about colour, think about composition, think about design. Okay? 
I love teaching like life drawing. I do very informal classes where I'm trying to bridge the gap between their observational drawing and their imagination. And so we play loud music, we get the life models to act out scenarios, and it can really, really change the, uh, the students' attitude to their drawing. very very creative um, and the results are amazing. We're renowned in the industry for having great degree shows you know, all the big art directors and designers want to go to. They're going out into a really fast changing industry at the moment and we expect them to be at the forefront of those changes. So they're working in games, they're working in um, animation production companies, they're working in Hollywood or on great publishing ideas. My graduates have gone into um, yeah, every area of the industry. They do really well. Presenting at London Fashion Week was amazing for me, of course. Um, I got a lot of good responses to it and people were very impressed by it. Stephanie created this amazing bodice, which attracted so much attention, so much press, Vogue has had it, Pixie Lots has borrowed it, she's actually had offers um, and orders for it, so it's exciting for her. So for the cards that you're going to do, the photographs that you're going to take for the 1st of March, will, you, will they be these? Yes, yeah. so you can see it there, and that's all with the wood incorporated again. I think the MA fashion yeah. course has really allowed me to experiment a lot with my designs and let me mature more in my style of fashion. Stephanie is one of a wide group of talented students that we have on the MA Fashion and her work has been particularly exciting. Stephanie was discovered in Holland. Um, our course director goes and handpicks every student that she particularly wants and luckily for us, Stephanie accepted. For one of the modules that we were doing was for, the, uh, for a company called Incrops and uh, we had to try to make a sustainable collection. The brief to the students was how can we make this luxurious, how can we make it uh, appealing to the consumer. For me the challenge was to try to create something sexy. I thought well maybe it would be amazing to mimic um, actual snake skin from such a plain material as wood. So uh, it started playing with the wood and the shapes and the sizing of the scales. And she realised that all the pieces had a sort of intricate shape but all different sizes. So she just by hand, she laser cuts all of the um, pieces and then put them together to make these amazing shapes. So at the moment I'm working on my end collection. I've laser cut wood into bead shapes, so I'm uh, wiring that on fishing wire and play around on my body to see what kind of shapes I can create and now trying to incorporate it with fabric. Stephanie has had exposure to a, a, an array of companies right up to Chanel. Most people want to start their own collection or work for a good fashion house and they help us find these connections and opportunities to get into that business. The world, in a sense, is her oyster, and this, at the MA of Fashion at Kingston is giving her the opportunity to be able to explore and experiment in all of those areas. I'm almost done with my course, and I'm really looking forward to stepping into this world and see what's out there for me.
historic royal palaces, including Hampton Court, has been working with Kingston University really closely for ages. There's such a lot that we have in common. We're practically next door, for heaven's sake. And they are interested in history and culture. They even come and bring their students here and do musical performances and drama performances in the Great Hall. The Knowledge Transfer Partnership consisted of Kingston University at one side, historic royal palaces at the other, and in the middle we had a research curator for three years who was responsible for getting the knowledge out of the university and into our visitor displays. The particular one that was held at Hampton Court sort of broke records because visitor numbers, which is kind of the crudest measure of its success, they went up like that. Really, before and afterwards, you could see that there were 100,000 extra visitors coming to Hampton Court. And more importantly than that, even I would say, they were having a really good time when they got here and they were learning all sorts of things about Tudor history and Henry VIII and getting excited about the past. In our last big project, which was the Knowledge Transfer Partnership, we were looking particularly at the Tudor side of Hampton Court and Henry VIII and the part that you know people know about. But we've got here the Baroque Palace. <laughs> This is England's Versailles, really, and this is the side that now needs our attention so that people get to know that it's here. Next year, 2013, at Hampton Court, we're having this exhibition called Secrets of the Royal Bedchamber, and it's going to explore what the King actually did in bed and how his beds were looked after. So we had the idea of going to Kingston University and saying, look, we need some help here, we need some research. They gave us a PhD student who worked for three years on this very topic. Her name's Olivia Fryman. She's achieved marvels. She's done some really, really interesting work. The exhibition is going to explore themes such as royal death, um, royal births, marriages, ceremonies that all took place in the bedchamber. And my research looked at those rituals and ceremonies. And so um, it's going to provide a lot of interpretation for the exhibition. So Hampton Court is really unique in that it has um, two fantastic state bedchambers and two private bedchambers that survive reasonably well intact today. So it's been a wonderful place to study and a wonderful place to see objects in their original location. We've got inside there the country's best collection of enormous four-poster magnificent state beds and you're going to be able to come and see them all. The Royal Bed Chambers here at Hampton Court are really interesting because they're not all designed to be slept in. The King and Queen actually had between two and three bed chambers um, and only the most private of those would have been slept in. Um, the state bed chamber from the reign of Charles II onwards becomes a much more public ceremonial space. Charles had lived at the French court during his exile, um, during the interregnum, and he brought back French customs to the English court, and that transformed the royal bedchamber into a much more theatrical, performative space. So within that room, he would allow courtiers to watch him dressing with his bedchamber servants, um, but he would also use the room for more formal occasions, such as knighting courtiers, um, and the rituals of births, marriages, and deaths also held in the bedchamber. It's been a wonderful four years of research and I feel that I've been welcomed both by Hampton Court and Kingston. Um, they've been brilliant at providing support between the two institutions. This was just a really, really exciting project, something that was new and different and, um, yeah, a real challenge.